Hello everyone, welcome back to Road of His Overtime on Road of His Radio, brought to you by Blue Wire. My name is Colin Kelly, you can follow me on Twitter at Overtime Ireland, and I am joined as always by my co-host here, it is Sean Siegel. Sean, we are going to have a fun show here today for all our listeners, we're going to talk through your in an updated wide receiver dynasty rankings, and this is something that I've got asked by a number of listeners over the last week or so, so they are, I'm sure, feverishly waiting to hear what we're going to discuss today. We're also going to discuss some waiver wire action over the last couple of days since waivers have run, who have been the most dropped, who have been the most added, and how you can use that to improve your own squad for your fantasy football team. But Sean, I want to start off with a plug for Stealing Bananas. This week, two shows wednesday and thursday so far and uh the thursday edition i really i i was laughing out loud i was literally loling as people would say and uh the dj Moore venting session really at one point i just i couldn't hold it in any longer i really it was like a therapy session for me in one way but i uh, i really enjoyed as ben discussed the decision of the panthers to punt that ball away late in the fourth quarter so i have to recommend that everyone if they haven't already check that out check out the latest Stealing Bananas podcast. But Sean, we're ready for NFL Week 3. We're going to dive into it from a couple of different perspectives here, but I'm excited. Two weeks into the season, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really starting to, to hypen up here. It is. And the fun part about early in the season is you just get these new revelations every week, right? Once we get to Week 6, 7, 8, I mean, you know more or less what most of the teams are going to look like, what the players are going to look like now. Clearly, we still get young players emerging i wouldn't be surprised if we get some david bell and wandell robinson action around that time we hope that sky Moore is starting to light the world on fire by that point but if he's not we're going to be looking at a breakout from him but you get into that range and you're starting to grind the waivers and try and figure out ways to make it through the bye weeks that's still a lot of fun a little bit different challenge but right now you feel like Secrets are emerging and coming to light every week. It's such an adventure. It's a lot of fun. Into the waiver wires and the waiver wire report tool up on rotavis.com will give you access to all the FFPC waivers. And looking at some of the most dropped players, Sean, I think is always something that's interesting to do because somebody who we dropped after drafting him was David Bell. You dropped his name there at the start of the show. He's somebody that we picked up again in one of our teams this week. No surprise to see, unfortunately, Trey Lance uh, leads the way here this week. Paris Campbell, though, is the next name up. Then we have Kenyon Drake, Terry and Davis Price, Kyle Phillips, Devontae Parker, Kenny Galladay, Brevin Jordan, Amir Abdullah. So we start to drop down then. No surprise we see Matt Ryan's name in there after his recent performance. Justin Fields with Sean, another quarterback that does get dropped there. Jalen Tolbert's in the mix, another younger player. Is there any names that stand out for you this week so far in the report, uh, we mentioned picking up David Bell. He was dropped in 36 main event teams this week. He was picked up in nine. So people can sour quite quick and panic quite quick. And that was a good conversation you and Ben also had on Stealing Bananas about you know not dropping for just a safe floor set of points to put in your roster to make sure you have that season-long upside. And it might take to week five, week six, week seven for some of these players. I guess the player that you could use quite easily in this you know, to be the probably all-time worst drop if you did drop him would have been somebody like an Odell Beckham who didn't play those first few weeks of the season and then went on to absolutely smash down the home stretch so who are some of the names Sean that maybe listeners should be either thinking about picking up now if they have a first come first serve or maybe should have in the the back of their mind ahead of next week's waiver runs yeah TDP obviously dropped because of the injury there He's someone who didn't break any big plays, but I thought he looked pretty good. And there was some question about whether he would even be the backup to Jeff Wilson. Big picture, I think you have to be a little bit encouraged. Kenyon drop, Kenyon Drake, a big drop candidate here. It's become pretty clear that if he has a viable fantasy game for the Baltimore Ravens, you're probably not going to be able to pick that out ahead of time. You mentioned Devontae Parker, someone who just really does look done. That doesn't mean that he couldn't catch some contested throws later on in the season, couldn't make a big play in the end zone. He was sort of the culprit slash the victim of a pass interference that wasn't called in week one, but then he goes back out there in week two, again, invisible. Jacoby Myers, Nelson Aguilar, Kendrick Bourne, those guys looking 
very dynamic by comparison. We know that they're not superstars either, although I've been very impressed by Myers and you know certainly Aguilar look good in week two. I think this offense is going to be better. Now, when I mention this fairly frequently, I'm not expecting them to be a juggernaut, but Mac Jones, someone I think has already demonstrated that he's going to have a solid NFL career and potentially as things evolve, you don't know necessarily with the Patriots where they're going to be in a year, two years, three years. They have Bill Belichick. He's going to want an explosive offense there over time. If he doesn't think he's getting it with their current approach, he's not going to be afraid to make some changes. They get Tyquan Thornton back at some point this season. They're going to have a decent amount of talent really on that team. Now, not you know like what we're seeing from the Miami Dolphins or the Philadelphia Eagles, or the Detroit Lions, but that's a team that is going to be able to move the ball as you kind of go down through this. And I also have the FPC contest clicked here. So more leagues to deal with. You mentioned Donovan Peoples Jones, someone who drew a lot of targets in week one, but then they really did change things up. And Amari Cooper was the guy in week two. It'll be interesting to see if Cleveland can support anything beyond him. It'll be interesting to see if Jacoby Brissett can have a similar type of game when they're playing against a a little bit better team than they were in week two. Jalen Tolbert getting dropped after back-to-back inactors. We see here Isaiah Spiller, 59 pickups, 191 drops. That's kind of an interesting mix. And Spiller is somebody I've been putting in for pickups. The backups to Austin Eckler looking really weak. So uh, there's going to be a situation here where the players who haven't been active through a couple of games, I mean, they're going to get dropped. There's no question about that. And it's not necessarily a bad play to drop them, but that's a name that I would keep an eye on. Obviously we're continuing to stash Rojo in a number of situations. It depends on how deep your league is. This is a 20 roster spot format. If you're at 16, I mean, these guys were not rostered already a week ago. I think the frustrating thing here, you see Noah Fant, 51 pickups, 180 drops. The Seahawks have talked about being more aggressive. I'm still interested in him. I think that he's a player where, especially once we start to get into the bye weeks, but maybe two or three weeks from now, he has a couple decent games. He scores a touchdown. He's going to get picked back up by a lot of dynasty managers. You see Marvin Jones with 33 drops or 161 drops, 33 pickups. He's somebody that once you get into the bye weeks, I think people are going to be looking at a little bit with how this Jaguars offense looks at least competent. Not elite, certainly. Beyond Christian Kirk, they're still pretty limited at the receiver position. That's an interesting name there. You and I actually picked up Alec Pierce for one of our teams. 132 drops, 65 pickups. These guys who kind of have the the balance of both, I think, are pretty fun. K.J. Hamler. 124 drops, 131 pickups. Added him back in on a league or two, especially with Jerry Judy now struggling with his injury. I I mean, we've we've kind of jokingly poked fun at the Broncos. And since I'm such a big Chiefs fan, obviously it's sort of funny to see them struggle with some of the things that they're dealing with. As they have a new head coach, they have a new QB. I don't think this offense is going to be as dynamic as we were all sort of hoping from a fun fantasy perspective. You know, even as a Chiefs fan, I think the most fun thing, if we look at the season, would be if Derek Carr were lighting the world on fire with Josh McDaniels and his new star wide receiver in Devontae Adams. If the new coaching staff and Russell Wilson were lighting the world on fire for the Denver Broncos... We had that game between the Chargers and the Chiefs where actually both defenses look good. And there, you know, there was some solid offensive play, but it wasn't a Bills level shootout type of game. I think that these offenses in the AFC West are going to get better as the season goes along. The Denver Broncos are not going to look like this when we get into week eight, week nine. There are going to be a lot of situations in which you can't afford to keep stashing KJ Hamler. But if you are in one where he's available and you have a spot that you're thinking about, what should I do? Hamler's not a guy that you and I are going to give up on that easily. No, and I think that's the difference. Sometimes it's Sean. 
we're going to have the players that we're targeting and we're also playing the long game over the course of the season we're probably going to be more patient with those younger rookie players second year players who we target a lot waiting for them to come along whereas we do see even this week for example Taysom Hill last week was a big pickup this week he's a big drop we see like you know a lot of players like that where one week they're the hot thing the next week they're they're chopped off OJ Howard another version like that this week so I think it's a lot of patience, especially with those younger players we have to keep. And Hamler's also coming back off that injury. We have to have that little bit of patience. But the thing is, with playing with Sean, something that I've really enjoyed learning over the years is being that week early, that two weeks early, and picking up a player to stash at the end of your roster when you're picking him up for you know two dollars, three dollars versus when he's a hot waiver wire pickup when he's you know four or five hundred dollars to try and pick up onto your roster. That's something that I, I've really taken away from playing with Sean to be able to know save have those smart waiver wire acquisitions a little bit ahead of time and if you do have to cut them you're not really losing out but if you have to pay those big bucks sometimes then you get into a little bit of trouble as the season progresses and you want to try and make some additional roster moves sean we are going to jump in though to your rest of season rankings and i'm looking forward to diving into some thoughts here to ask you some questions on how we think these are going to play out there's probably going to be some players here that we're not overly surprised by you do have tier one justin jefferson jamar chase leading the way here we have now justin jefferson moving into spot one jamar chase in spot two they do change from where they were in the preseason for rest of season um so just a slight move justin jefferson though has just looked tremendous jamar chase has looked pretty much tremendous as well not really anything to see there i'm pretty sure they're basically 1a and 1b at this point anything to add or will we we shuffle down to the next tier yeah, I don't think there's anything that we I haven't added already. Here. The, <laughs> I mean, these guys for me were ranked fourth and sixth overall heading into the season. So that's very high when you talk about super flex rankings. If you're talking about non super flex rankings, they'd be one and two, right? So these guys are basically in a dead heat i did like what we saw from justin jefferson and the vikings in week one and not overly concerned about the small dip there in week two it, in many ways maybe a little bit more disappointed that the Bengals have not been nearly as explosive we're just as confident overall as i was hoping in the first two weeks but that's not something that you expect to continue in terms of where they move within that overall group I think there's an argument to be made that Jalen Hurts moves from around number 11, 12 to maybe as high as even number four, right? And so then you have maybe Jefferson at five, Chase at six, something in that range. But but these guys are the clear top tier at wide receiver in Dynasty. Yeah, they're just they're just looking so good the next players though and obviously it's dynasty the players can be younger but for listeners long-time listeners of road of his overtime or the road of his podcast you'll know that it's younger players that are going to be at the high end of this list so jill and waddle though makes a, a reasonable jump here then we have drake london guard wilson wilson obviously coming off his big game last week so drake london guard wilson really up into that upper echelon in tier two but at the high end of it and we have t higgins aj brown but then we have some of the veterans in cooper cup Stefan Diggs but then CD Lamb is in there as well I know he's somebody that we talked about last week having that dip obviously the quarterback change at the moment with Dak being injured but CD Lamb has not looked all that much like what we have hoped we would see maybe if we go back two three years when he's coming into the league we're expecting him to really push in to be in that high high end of wide receiver and it just hasn't really clicked the the I guess the production hasn't been what we've hoped all along the way. So he has slid down a little bit here. He is now down to 10th at the wide receiver position. He was at three in the preseason. So how are you feeling with that kind of tier of wide receiver? And how are you feeling about that CD Lamb rank after what we discussed last week? Yeah, this is a good group. And the youth is incredibly important which is one of the reasons that you have Cup and Diggs only at eight and nine. And that's after they've had two weeks for the ages. All right, We're talking about only a handful of players this century who have outscored them at the receiver position through two weeks. Jalen Waddle moves up to number three. I think that's 
you know, very exciting if you have him on some rosters. Had him ranked fifth in the preseason. His dynasty ADP at that point was eighth. And so if you're following the rankings here, you got him a little bit above where you made him a priority, and now you've benefited from that. I also have labeling here sort of of green, red, and then just flat for the other players, which I think helps because when you see the new rankings, you want to know if guys have moved up and down because other players have jumped ahead of them where their own value has more or less stayed the same or if they're actually dropping. So C.D. Lamb is a dropper, right? He was a preseason dynasty rank of the position, wide receiver only, of number four. He falls to 10. Debo was six. He falls to 11. But that part is not on him. It's a matter of these other guys moving up and jumping ahead of him, even though his value is flat. So if you go from six to 11, you stay in this tier here. But if you go from 6 to 11 and your thesis is more or less the same, then what we've seen is that this top end at the wide receiver position has gotten more valuable just in total, which is great. Because one of the things we talked about a lot this offseason was really kind of moving in the direction of building your entire team around wide receivers, not taking the risk on these expensive running backs as the position goes into this mild decline. One of the things that we've seen through two weeks very clearly is that the golden age of the Uber back probably over. Now that doesn't mean that we're not going to get some huge running back weeks during the season because we will, or that we're not going to have some huge individual seasons from running backs over the next five to 10 years because we will. But the time period where you're getting double digit rushing and receiving EP numbers from multiple guys that part I think is probably over for a while. Now we do have an interesting class coming in next year. Perhaps there will be two, even three running backs who could quickly join that group. Brees Hall has looked absolutely fantastic through two games. And if he didn't have an Austin Eckler like talent in Michael Carter there with him, then maybe he would be one of those guys. So we're going to get an infusion of youth at running back. That will be important as this kind of previous group ages out. But I mean, the wide receivers look very, very good. There are going to be some listeners who are questioning those rankings on London as number four overall. Wilson as number five overall. Again, both of these guys well above ADP in terms of where we had them ranked. And this gets back to how you want to value the players when you're looking at London and especially within the context of, of some of the guys he played with there at USC, when you look at Wilson, the context of the guys he played with there at Ohio State, you see where they're drafted, you see their ages. It's so incredibly valuable to be ahead on those players because once they do what they've done these first couple of weeks, now you more or less can't acquire them. And these are guys where they're going to score a lot of points and you can play them for a long time before you trade them. And then you can trade them at their peak. You contrast that with players who are in their quote unquote peak right now. And if you try and play them for a couple of years and then trade them, you get in the situation where your dynasty team, number one, is at risk because any type of injury or an unexpected stretch of bad play is going to knock down number one, obviously the points you score, but then the trade value, you can't get that back out from them. The tight rope that we want to walk is one where our teams are scoring a lot of points in the now because we want to win, but also are built so the trade value is constantly increasing little by little. The great thing here would be to build a team that's so powerful that you are using the perpetual reloading idea and you're moving some of these veterans and yet you have such a strong team that it just wouldn't make sense to move them all at once. You wouldn't have enough roster spots to take back everything that you could get in return and so you have this mix of the youth with a guy like stefan diggs with a guy like cooper cup it was fun column to get some emails this week talking about rotoviz and the connection to diggs i think we had a listener with a really fun claim that he has always argued with his friends that stefan diggs is better than michael thomas and has given us some credit for that we love diggs we always have. It's so cool to see what he's doing now. Obviously, I wish I had more of him in redraft. 
it was a lot of fun to look up the dynasty scores on Tuesday morning and see that extra 45 to 50 points <laughs> on all of those. Some of the teams that you're thinking, well, it was a, it was a solid week, but maybe I'll lose or it was a solid week. And, you know, I'm not going to blow anybody away in terms of the, the points battle. And then you look back up on Tuesday morning or if obviously you're, you're staying up late night Monday and you see, well, now I've got 200 points in the scoring column here. And you feel very, very good about that. Diggs has been absolutely phenomenal. It's so cool to see. Hopefully, <laughs> for some of our redraft teams, Gabe Davis will be healthy this week. T. Higgins, A.J. Brown, a couple of other guys in there. I, I just think it's been so fun to watch these young players play the first couple of weeks here. And then we get into Tier 3. And that one also both interesting and a little controversial. Some young players there. Ben made a great argument for Traylon Burks in our Ceiling Bananas show. I argue that Jamison Williams, even though he hasn't played yet, is probably someone you want to get out there and buy while you still can. A number of other fun young names on this list as well. Yeah, and the, the part, I, I didn't know how long you were going to, to mention the names, but the part that I wanted to try and, I was going to interrupt and say, but again, comes back to the profile of the player that we're trying to target. Obviously in Dynasty, it's going to be trying to get younger players, but specific profiles as well. But what you will see if you read Sean's article, which will be linked in today's show notes, the players that are jumping the most and the players who are ascending in value or ascending in Sean's rankings are those first, second year players or some third year players there? We mentioned, for example, though, Cup and Diggs, you know, they have ascended, but they're only going to ascend to a certain point as well based on their age curve and where they are at this point in their career. Other players who make it in, Sean, from the veterans that have moved up is Tyreek Hill. But again, a, a very small move. You mentioned, though, Debo Samuel stayed firm. Devontae Adams is in tier three. He stays firm with kind of where he is. But when we look at the other names that have really jumped here, it is Rashad Bateman, obviously a massive week two performance from him. I'm on Ross St. Brown, who blew the doors off in week two. Jahan Dodson, who has started the season very strongly. And he was somebody who, in redraft season, Sean, you were mentioning that we should be getting more and more of him as it moved closer to the season and how it will work out. And, and so far, Dodson has, you know, far where he went in the draft, there was criticism of that. There was criticism of the landing spot. But he has has really looked good. He's another player who has jumped quite a bit here. Gabe Davis moving up as well, and Chris Olave, even with out a huge amount of production, has has moved up based on what we've seen from him in those brief moments. But Sean, first year and second year players making the by far the biggest jumps. And again, when it comes to our redraft teams, why we're drafting those rookies in the preseason is having that little bit of a dynasty mindset as to how they will ascend in ADP value if we redrafted that team again and. October, November based on it. But we can see here already this group of wide receivers, the rookies and last year's set of rookies. So second year players this year have have really jumped in. And it feels like you mentioned the Uber back maybe, you know, a thing of the past or fading into the background, but it feels like we're in a real golden age of wide receivers here. We we maybe thought we were already in that with the 2014 class and how that run has gone. But this group that have come in over the last three seasons have have really just set us up for a, a golden age of wide receiver scoring and, and fantasy football and, and I guess wide receivers in the NFL. I completely agree. And in the article, we'll talk about how the last time we were in a position that was this dynamic, this exciting was probably 2015. And in some ways you could even argue that despite what a fantastic situation we were in in 2015, that those guys didn't live up to the billing quite the way that you would have hoped. Obviously we had that elite 2014 rookie class, but there were some mid career guys in that 23, 24, 25, even 26 range in 2015 who were ready to absolutely destroy the NFL. Some of those names come through some of the names, a little bit disappointing, but even the ones who disappointed were going to give you significant fantasy production for a, a long time period. And so we're, we're back into that stage now where the young players in 2022 
are set up to allow you to win dynasty leagues for a long time. One of the things I think is the coolest here is that when you look at the rankings, the vast majority of the risers are players that we had well ahead of ADP. One of the things we talked about when I was drafting with Patrick Kareem, when I was drafting with Matt Jones, doing a couple startups this year, different ways to attack the startup that maybe allowed you to work around how difficult it was to trade down, how difficult it was to trade out because of the perception of this 2023 rookie class and that drafting a lot of young players from this year's class that wasn't as highly thought of, but in large part because it didn't have the elite quarterbacks, it didn't have a Kyle Pitts, it didn't have depth at the running back position, but we were going to still have these wide receivers. And they also were not being looked at in startups the way that they should have been. And so as opposed to trying to get these 2023 first round picks, go out there and draft a Drake London, a Garrett Wilson, a Traylon Burks, a Jamison Williams, draft a Chris Olave, draft a Jahan Dotson. And Dotson is somebody that we moved up a lot as all of the information came out. And I think he's a good example of when you do need to change how you're looking at things back during the sort of very early rookie draft process, we were talking about Dotson probably being overdrafted by the Washington commanders didn't exactly have the profile that would justify what they paid, but that his profile in a lot of ways is very similar to Olave, another player who looked like he was probably overdrafted and that Dotson was a good arbitrage play on Olave. Maybe both of those guys, not necessarily targets in rookie drafts, but then as you see that Dotson very clearly is the star of Washington's offseason, you look at what he's doing and the rapport he's building with the QBs. You think about the fact that I really thought they were going to have even more potential opportunity for him, but Curtis Samuel has come in and had a very good start to the season. My thought on it is that Terry McLaurin probably, although a very solid reality player in his own way, probably is a little bit overvalued in fantasy. It was not going to be the roadblock that it might seem. We made a lot of bold predictions that Dotson would be the wide receiver one in Washington. Obviously, we don't know that that's going to be the case, but his first two weeks have been very, very promising. So both understanding the context and how the players should be ranked originally, but then being willing to come off of that if you're very clearly wrong and move him up to the appropriate level and get the exposure you need to have that work out for you. So we have exposure in some of those later startups. We have the exposure in redraft. I'm very excited to have him in a lot of formats. That's awesome. And Sean, there is obviously a tier four. We're not going to go into that, but there is a lot more of the fallers in that. There's some of the guys that are involved in Thursday Night Football, which will be played after the show or played before the show is released but the question that i have for you based on the players that i mentioned the likes of cup digs then we obviously have Devonte adams and tyreek hill so they're the main veterans that are in this top tier say let's say the top 20 to 24 wide receivers in the dynasty rankings the championship window keeping that open moving those veterans getting that value when it's at the peak for you are those veterans all clear players that people should be looking to trade out at this point if people are in their teams now and they're like well this team looks to get us a chance to win this year i can't really afford to to trade away a uh, Devonte adams what should you what what should people be changing their mindset there should they be thinking let's move adams let's try and get one of these younger guys and plus maybe something else because people might value that veteran a little bit more or a cooper cup for example if you can move maybe a cooper cup for a jill and waddle you know, you have Waddle ranked higher here. Are they the sort of moves that you'd be recommending that listeners should be trying to attempt over the next uh, week or two? I think you can definitely do that. I think that you also want to understand the market and that coming off of those massive games, I, there's no reason to believe that Cooper Cup and Stefan Diggs couldn't be good for a while at this point. Your biggest concern is that Maybe a T. Higgins, and maybe we'll not jump and get Waddle. Maybe a T. Higgins. Yeah, I mean, Higgins is the player who does fall for me a little bit here. 
again, really through no fault of his own. He has the concussion in the first game. He comes back and has the nice week two. You just want to see the Bengals offense be more explosive than it's been through two weeks. I mean, this should be this should be a team that's putting up the kind of game that we saw from the Dolphins, right? And for them to really fulfill the potential they have, their mindset has to be more in that direction, which means they've got to figure out some of the issues with the offensive line and they've got to build the team and the scheme in such a way that they can both attack deep and get some of these plays off. I I don't think that you can criticize a coaching staff that just came through, you know, beat the Kansas City Chiefs and almost won the Super Bowl. I mean, that's not a situation where like, well, and this this coaching staff needs to get their act together. You do want them to get their act together, right? I mean, they need to be accomplishing some of the things that we've seen from the Dolphins. I just, it's not a great sign in some ways. And this is probably overstated. It's kind of a fun thing for reporters to write about and be like, oh, this this rookie wide receiver who's barely played in the NFL has some ideas about how the Bengals can fix their offense. But you're a month into the season last year and the reports are coming out that Jamar Chase is telling Joe Burrow and telling the coaching staff, look, you got to let me go deep and you've got to throw over the top and we've got to stretch these defenses out. So they have to defend more than a five yard area. And all this pressure isn't leading us to all of these value destroying handoffs to Joe Mixon, who from a reality basis is a huge negative. Anytime that you're giving him the ball in a football game and all of these sacks and then that worked, right? You, you can't have Jamar Chase be the guy who is seeing this and saying, we've got to do it and then executing it. But you have Jamar Chase, you have T Higgins. Getting back to your actual question on Cooper Cup and Stephon Diggs. This is where having a feel for how you want to manage your own team is going to be important. If you have a true championship team that you've built in such a way that you have depth everywhere and you have future picks. You want to get to where your team is so powerful that you have those guys and you don't actually need to move them because your overall roster has so much firepower that bringing in more young talent is redundant in some ways. And so having these very top scores in addition to having all of the depth and all of the future picks is something that helps you win. And the nuance there can be tricky because we do want to perpetually reload, perpetually reload. But part of the idea there is that you create this superpower that has such a great chance to win your title and you wouldn't be just moving every single player because even in a 30 roster spot format as opposed to a 20 roster spot format in the the RV Triflex, You can only get so much value and you can only get so many future picks. One of the things that's fun about the team I have with Ben is that we do have a very good team like actually on the roster. And then we have so many picks in next year's draft that, I mean, we're going to have to then make trades after the draft to cut back by like 10 guys again and like 10 elite guys with, I think right now we have three first round picks and six second round picks, which in super flex, those second round picks end up in many cases being very, very valuable. So then you get to the point where a consolidation is actually helpful as well. In terms of trading players like cup and like Diggs, who look like they are in position to compete, to be the fantasy MVP. That really is more of the way to play it if you're in a true rebuild, which we're hoping to not really be in very often. Once you get into the true rebuild, then your timeline gets off the perpetual reload by contrast. I mean, you should be fighting for that first round by every single season and never be in this situation where you've got to make those kinds of deals. Yeah. So we'll see anyone that does make any of those moves would be interested over the next couple of weeks. Send us, an email in or send it my way on twitter and uh we can we can look through and, and review some of those we don't have time to do it today sean i did a trade recently where i did move Devonte adams and we maybe we'll take that up on one of the shows early next week to see what sean siegel's thoughts are on it it was quite late at night 
some beverages had been drank at the time. So we'll see how it looks in the, the cold light of day. But myself and Sean will then be back bright and early, depending on your time zone, Monday morning, show drops at 5 a.m. Eastern time. Very, I had some people, Sean, reach out and say that they're in the same time zone as you and they were listening to the show at 3 a.m. their time. So we have some people who are very dedicated to get that. So my promise to you is that the show will be there and available for you bright and early on Monday to get your instant thoughts from Sean Siegel and myself from NFL Week 3 and what has happened in that time. Some very big matches coming up this weekend that I think will be a, a lot of fun. So looking forward to recapping them with Sean this week. If you are subscribing to the Road of His website, you haven't done so already, or you're renewing, you can use the code RV Radio 2022 at checkout to get yourself a 10% discount off a Road of His NFL pass. Get you access to all of the content and tools that we discuss on the show that are available on the website. So once again, that code is RV Radio 2022. That is going to bring us to the end of today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Overtime Ireland. My co-host is Sean Siegel. Check out all of Sean's work up on rotaviz.com, including what we talked about today, which will be linked in today's show notes. And until we're back on Monday, have a good one.